Undeniable, Part 7. We've been looking at the book uh, written by Douglas Sachs, how, uh, Undeniable, How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life Is Designed, written just this year, <coughs> published by HarperCollins. I'm sorry. Um, there's the uh, cover of the book. Uh, the <coughs> summary of the book, which is condensed from uh, the summary that the book gives of itself, is that Douglas Axe argues that the key to understanding our origin is the design into intuition, the innate belief held by all humans, the tasks we would need knowledge to accomplish, can only be accomplished by someone who has that knowledge. For the ingenious task of inventing life, this knower can only be God. There is science that proves our design intuition is valid. Everyday experience can empower ordinary people to defend their design intuition. Living creatures are brilliantly conceived, utterly beyond the reach of accident. And uh, his summary of what we're going to be talking about, the following two chapters, we're going to be dealing with chapter 11 right now, 11 and 12, will serve as a reality check. First, by considering carefully whether we have overlooked anything in rejecting the evolutionary explanation of life, that's chapter 11, and then by asking whether the scientific community's de defense of evolution looks more like a science thing or a culture thing. Chapter 11, Seeing and Believing. Again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, just uh, um, a good share of it, and you'll see where I omit stuff. The courage to defend our design intuition comes not just from the common sense argument we've developed, but from the bigger picture as well. Everything seems to fit. Humans stand apart from all other living things as the one species that seeks wisdom and knowledge, the sapient species, Homo sapiens. If we know as we're meant to be, then surely we were meant to know what we were meant to be. And indeed we are. Well before our formal education begins, we have already mastered the simple science of interpreting our everyday experiences. This science produces in our young minds the universal de design intuition. With or without parental approval, we know instinctively that living wonders are so remarkably good at being what they are, spiders being spiders and orcas being orcas, they exist only because someone made them for the express purposes of being what they are. If you saw this instinct as being more heart than head before you started reading, I hope our journey has corrected that imbalance. Does anything not fit then? This is an important question to ask whenever we think we've come to a correct understanding of a contentious subject. It's not a question of completeness, but rather a question of contradiction. Indeed, as we'll see in the final chapter, acknowledging that science shows life to be designed hardly begins to answer the important scientific questions. It merely opens the door to a correct conception of biology, a door that has been blocked and barred for well over a century. The weighty intellectual challenge of building that long-awaited correct conception after thinkers have filed through the door in large number has barely begun, and that's perfectly fine. The first aim for this chapter is simply to consider whether we've overlooked any facts that somehow refuse to fit into this otherwise coherent picture of a designed world. If we haven't, my next aim will be to equip experts in common science, like you, to stand firm in a world where certain experts in technical science do their best to push others around. He has a chapter on materialism that I won't uh, repeat. Uh, the view from the stands. According to journalist Paul Rosenberg, writing for Salon, things could get a whole lot worse for creationists because of Jeremy England, a young MIT professor who's proposed a theory based on thermo in thermodynamics showing that the emergence of life was not accidental but necessary. When I first read that, I thought, what? And remember, the creationists, in their view, includes intelligent design advocates. By necessary, Rosenberg means so physically inevitable as to be unremarkable. 
England does seem to espouse this no big deal view of life's origin. And he's quoting, you start with a random clip, a clump of atoms, he says, and if you shine light on it for long enough, it should not be so surprising that you get a plant. Rain happens. Life happens. I know, you're, you're going, whoa. Talk about miracles, yes, yes, yes. If you get a PhD after your name, does that mean that you uh, never say nonsense again? What are we to make of this? In particular, what should you do if you feel this certain this MIT professor is wrong, but also know you'll never be able to follow his argument? You could search the web to find people with PhDs who dispute his claim, but there would probably be people with PhDs who dispute the disputers as well, and so on. In the end, this technical toing and froing gives little aid to non-experts, apart from the comfort of knowing that at least some experts are on their side. However, if the decisive matters in this discussion belong not to the technical disciplines, but rather to common sense and common science, as I've claimed, then this picture of non-scientists as spectators at a sporting event where most of the players are wearing the Darwin jersey is all wrong. When it comes to simple intuitive reasoning, the playing field is level and everyone is qualified to play. The inconceivability of accidental invention. As common science scientists move down from the stands and flood the field, the most important advice for them to bear in mind is the familiar call to keep your eye on the ball. We have arrived at what looks to be a decisive argument. In a sentence, functional coherence makes accidental invention fantastically improbable and therefore physically impossible. Invention can't happen by accident. This is the ball then. To become distracted by any defense of accidental origins that doesn't answer this argument is to take our eye off the ball. Instead, we're wondering whether there's a single piece of work out there that should convince us this argument is wrong. What would this even look like? Can we be wrong to attribute functional coherence to biological systems? I can imagine people thinking this is wrong, and of course some of them used to, but only out of ignorance. Certainly ignorance as to the necessity of functional coherence within cells existed among some biologists of Darwin's day. Writing in 1868, nine years after the publication of On the Origin of Species, German biologist Ernst Haeckel said the following about the aquatic microorganisms he classified under the heading Monera. Now remember this is Haeckel's quote. These very simplest of all organisms yet known, and which at the same time are the simplest imaginable organisms, are the Monera living in water. They are very small living corpuscles, which strictly speaking do not at all deserve the name organism. For the designation organism applied to living creatures rests upon the idea that every living natural body is composed of organs of various parts, which fit into one another and work together, as do the different parts of an artificial machine, in order to produce the action of the whole. So these little things don't have organs, so they're not organisms, or they're almost not organisms. During, the late, during late years, we have become acquainted with Monera, organisms which are in fact not composed of any organs at all, but consist entirely of shapeless, simil, simple, homogeneous matter. Describing cyanobacteria as sh shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter. The entire body of one of these monera during life is nothing more than a shapeless, mobile little lump of mucus or slime consisting of an albuminous combination of carbon. Simpler or more imperfect organisms we cannot possibly conceive. That is Heckel. As you may have guessed, cyanobacteria, the stunningly sophisticated photosynthetic marvels we encountered in chapter 10, are among the bacterial species to which Heckel referred here. He couldn't have been more wrong about their internal structure. And moreover, his error can't be excused as though no one knew better back then. Well, they didn't know much better, but they did know some anyway. Some 200 years earlier, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek 
one of the pioneers of light microscopy and the father of microbiology, observed the complex powered movement of many bacterial species in water. Add to this the observation of bacterial cell division and the conclusive demonstration by Louis Pasteur that bacteria only come from bacteria, all well in place before 1868. And there's really no excuse for Heckel to have missed the fact that remarkable processes were going on inside these little creatures. Indeed, the tiny scale of those processes should have brought recognition that they had to be far more sophisticated than the artificial mechanisms he mentioned, clocks and steam engines and the like. Despite his blunder, the quote showed that Haeckel had a well-formed notion of functional coherence, evident in his description of a hierarchy of components working together to form a functional whole. What he lacked was the conviction that sophisticated functions are never achieved without functional coherence. No one with an interest in biology makes this mistake today, that living things all the way down to bacteria are chock full of systems that exhibit functional coherence all the way down to their molecular constituents is now such a pervasive theme in biology as to be unmissable. As for the connection between functional coherence and fantastic improbability, here again we have something that can be overlooked but not refuted. Interestingly, even one of the most ardent defenders of Darwinism in recent times, Richard Dawkins, has not overlooked it. The first chapter of his 1986 book, The Blind Watchmaker, is filled with explaining the very improbable. There he describes the connection as follows. Quote, however many ways there are, may be of being alive, it is certain that there are vastly more ways of being dead, or rather, not alive. You may throw cells together at random over and over again for a billion years, and not once will you get a conglomeration that flies or swims or burrows or runs or does anything, even badly, that could re remotely be construed as working to keep itself alive. That is Richard Dawkins, the blind watchmaker, no less. The very same principle applies at levels above and below the cell. Coherent skeletons are impossibly rare among random arrangements of bones, as are coherent body plans among random arrangements of organs, and molecular machines among random arrangements of folded proteins, and folded proteins among random arrangements of amino acids. According to our analysis, none of these inventions had any prospect of coming together by accident. They all required insight. Dawkins still thinks natural selection can do the work of insight, but we know better. Interestingly, his own words point to the gaping hole in Darwin's theory, which we saw back in Chapter 7. Natural selection happens only after cells are arranged in ways that work to keep the organism alive. So selection can hardly be the cause of these remarkable arrangements. Darwin's simplistic ex explanation has failed, and the millions who have followed him have nothing but his outdated assumption to stand on. The stepping stones over which these followers think life has skittered from one form to the next are definitely not explained by natural selection. Selection steps to forms that, are all, that already exist, so it doesn't explain the forms themselves, much less the intricately engineered circumstances that would have been needed for these forms to be connected through lines of descent. And the problem never goes away. Because the impossibility of accidental invention is at the root, and because each new form of life amounts to a new high-level invention, the origin of the thousandth new life form is no more explicable in Darwinian terms than the origin of the first. Well, at least than the origin of the second. <clears throat> Even if we suppose a first insect to have been formed somehow, without trying to explain how, all the countless insects that differ substantially from that first one would still be new top-level inventions, especially those that have brand new functional genes. The component inventions common to all insects would have had their specific representations in that first insect. But a great many of these components would have had to be substantially reworked to suit each new insect. 
This would have been a staggering feat of re-engineering in itself, to say nothing of the great variety of new components that would have had to be invented from scratch. In the end, each new form of life amounts to a stunning new invention, and since the hallmark of invention is functional coherence, which accidental causes can't explain, we rightly see each form as a distinct masterpiece. So notice he's not just arguing that evolution can't get to the big thing. He's saying that it's pervasive all the way down. Accident is out of the picture. Stepping stones connecting these masterpieces are either a figment of our storyteller imagination, or if they're there, proof that God has at times converted the world into an exquisite nanofabrication facility. There is no substitute for brilliance, so either the stones are part of the brilliance or they aren't anything at all. The genius of life is not in question. The only question is how the genius of life did his work. And then there's this little box, because each f new form of life amounts to a new high-level invention, the origin of the thousandth new life form is no more explicable in Darwinian's terms than the origin of the first. Touring England, returning to England, Jeremy England, and my aim of liberating readers from their dependence on experts, I don't mean to suggest that non-experts should ignore the debate among experts. The reward for following that debate, even as a casual observer, is a sense of how things are shifting within the academy, which is worth having. So while I hope every reader is able to say why England's equation, light plus random atoms plus time equals the living plant, can't be correct, I think readers will also be interested to know how one of the world's leading chemists views this idea of life originating by chemical accident. I'm referring to Jim Tour, professor of chemistry and nanoengineering at Rice University, whom I met after a stunning presentation he gave at a meeting at Baylor University in, 19, in 2009. The best way I can describe his work is to say that he and his team do with atoms what kids do with construction toys. If you think I'm kidding, Try Googling nano car or nano dragster. When it comes to understanding from first-hand experience the difficulty of making atoms come together to form molecular devices, very few people can match Jim to her. I certainly can't, and I'm pretty sure Jeremy England can't either. With all due respect to England and his theory then, it would be interesting to know what Tour thinks but the casual confidence so many scientists seem to have in the ability of unguided natural processes to build complex molecular devices. Tour says, if one asks the molecularly informed how nature devises reactions with such high purity, the answer is often nature selects for that. But what does that mean to a synthetic chemist? <clears throat> what does selection mean? To select it must still rid itself of all the material it did not select. And from where did all the needed starting material come? And how does it know what to select when the utility is not assessed until many steps later? The details are stupefying, and the petty comments demonstrate the sophomoric understanding of the untrained. And I guess he would include Jeremy England in the untrained. In other words, the only thing people demonstrate when they assume such things can't happen by accident is that they don't know, or can happen by accident, is that they don't know what they're talking about. The magician's hat. For those occasions when you don't have someone like Tour at your side, here's a simple way you can test supposed proofs that accidental invention works. Think of the illusion of pulling a rabbit out of an empty hat. What makes this trick entertaining is that we seem to be witnessing the impossible. We know a rabbit can't come out of a hat unless it first went in. And yet we have the impression that nothing went in except the hand now holding the rabbit. It looks like magic, but it's merely an illusion. Even if we have no idea how the trick was performed. After all, if anybody really had the ability to bring things into existence out of nothing, 
they would find a more productive way to use their superpower than by working as an entertainer. But the impression of magic and our ability to analyze that impression in this way by surveying the bigger picture will help us to know what to make of supposed demonstrations of the power of evolution. Think of the hat as a conceptual black box that surrounds and conceals all the inner workings of one of those demonstrations. As with the rabbit trick, our strategy is to compare what went in with what came out without worrying about what happened inside. In doing this, we should pay particular attention to knowledge because of its essential role in invention. The first question to ask of a demonstration is whether it even gives the appearance that the impossible has occurred. If not, then it clearly doesn't address our argument. Our claim is very simple. Having noticed that we intuitively know invention can't happen by accident, we believe we've now come to a firm understanding of why this intuition must be correct. To counter this claim, someone will have to show that both intuition and calculation affirm the what both intuition and calculation affirmed to be impossible, somehow isn't impossible. Anyone not even pretending to do this hasn't understood what needs to be demonstrated. Of the many demonstrations I've encountered over the last 30 years, no one, not one, passes this test of relevance. No one has said, look, we found a way for the impossible to happen. Instead, they offer unsurprising examples where searches that should succeed do or where selective homing that should work does. In doing so, they ignore the fact that invention by accident requires fantastically improbable searches to succeed. Since that is the unbelievable claim, that is what they would have to demonstrate. And if they did, well, the demonstration would be the world's first scientifically proved, mathematically validated instance of magic. Even then, I think we, uh, we would find it viscerally impossible not to attribute the outcome to an invisible knower, which would leave our design intuition intact. If you see somebody levitating, you wonder about there being a supernatural power that does it. <clears throat> Passing the hat or not. A couple of examples will prepare to you to use the hat yourself. The first is a demonstration that Richard Dawkins offered in The Blind Watchmaker, where a computer program started with a random sequence of 28 letters and spaces and ended up with a Shakespearean line, methinks it is like a weasel, supposedly by evolution. I'm going to skip over some of his uh, 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 comments. Dawkins, uh, to kind of cut to the chase, Dawkins knew that this wasn't blind evolution, of course, in spite of what you may hear. His intended point was simply that cumulative selection, where improvements are allowed to build a little bit at a time, can accomplish what would never be accomplished if the whole finished thing had to appear at once. In his words, if there was a way in which, and by the way, that's his ellipse, ellipses, um, if there was a way in which the necessary conditions for cumulative selection could have been set up by the blind forces of nature, strange and wonderful things might have been the consequences. Granted, but then strange and wonderful assumptions often imply strange and wonderful consequences, don't they? And I'm going to skip over the next little thing. Nearly 20 years after Dawkins' demonstration comes another worth mentioning. This one announced on the cover of Discover magazine with the words, Testing Darwin, scientists at Michigan State prove evolution works. What supposedly evolved was a co computational function, so you would need a bit, of a bit of technical knowledge to understand what came out of the hat. In just a moment, I'll show how the hat comes through even without this knowledge. But first, let me give you this assurance. The computational function that was produced was so elementary that it wouldn't have merited attention apart from the claim that it evolved. So since computer science was one of the competencies that scientists brought to the project, we again have a situation where what came out of the hat is not the least bit remarkable considering what went in. Still, one aspect of this demonstration may seem to challenge our conclusion about functional coherence, at least at first glance. 
The output function in this case required 19 or so elementary machine instructions to be arranged into a working hole. And the investigators didn't explicitly supply this arrangement the way Dawkins supplied his. This seems to imply the functional that, that, that functional coherence was produced over the course of this evolutionary simulation. <clears throat> what do we make of this? First, keep in mind that our claim is not that blind processes are incapable of producing any functional coherence at all, but rather that they are in incapable of producing it in the amounts needed for useful inventions. We've already seen very small amounts of, what, of functional coherence appear by chance, as when the word ink appeared in half a page of random typing, or when a random grouping of four pixels just happened to have blended colors. The action of bulldozers moving junk heaps at the dump, for example, may well cause a ball bearing to find a makeshift socket or a lever to find a crude fulcrum or a cable to wrap itself around a cylinder. But none of these simple arrangements do anything significant enough to rise above junk. Not even on a trillion trillion planets covered with junk would an accidental robot ever rise up and flee from the bulldozers. <laughs> Much less scurry around looking for parts to build a copy of itself. Once this hard fact is grasped, the thought of quibbling over whether nine coherent keystrokes or 19 coherent machine instructions ought to be heralded as significant inventions becomes pointless. Both are completely insignificant compared to what people commonly set out to accomplish with words or with computer code, to say nothing of all these extraordinary accomplishments we call life. There's more to this story, though, at least for those able to dig deeper. If you have the ability to dissect demonstrations that prove evolution works, you'll find that the researchers commonly embed their knowledge of what was needed for success into their evolutionary models. In other words, there is cheating going on here, though the researchers may not think of it as such. In a way, it's hard not to cheat with these simple demonstrations. For example, the scientists who reported the evolution of the computational function had to offset the cost of useless genetic instructions in their digital organisms by rewarding them in proportion to the size of their genomes. As we saw with the stepping stone experiment at the end of chapter 7, real life behaves very differently. Genes that don't work are a burden. And nature has no incentive program to offset this burden. Most of us can't dig that deeply, though. In fact, if we don't even understand what came out of the hat, how are we supposed to decide whether it looks like magic? As I said, the hat comes through even here. Instead of asking whether the demonstration looks like magic to you, ask yourself whether it seems to look like magic to the people who understand it. Are they acting as though they've encountered a, fo a fountain of invention? Are the experts trembling with astonishment? Are investors scrambling to get a piece of the action? Are technology companies letting all their smart people go, convinced that human insight has now become superfluous? Fiddler for hire. As a finder of inventions, Darwin's evolutionary mechanism is a complete bust. But as we saw in Chapter 7, it is sometimes comes in handy as a fiddler. The example I described where a weakly functional enzyme was dramatically improved demonstrated this. Skipping on, for example, NASA has used selective optimization to help design some of its antennas, including the small one shown in figure 11.3, which we'll see in a minute. This antenna, which looks like nothing more than a randomly bent paper clip mounted on a threaded base, actually has its bends in just the right places to enable it to work well. Antenna shapes are ideally suited to selective organization because nearly every shape works to some degree, and yet small adjustments have measurable effects. And there's the antenna. And you can see it just kind of stuck out there. It actually works. And it was refined by natural selection. This means the antenna's origin fails the hat test. It looks nothing like magic because the needed understanding was supplied in the usual way. 
but this realization doesn't detract from the value of the antenna or the value of the selective optimization. Keep in mind that the hat test isn't a test of usefulness or scientific validity, but a test of relevance to our argument against accidental invention. By failing the hat test, the antenna merely shows that it's not an invention that appeared by accident. A team of scientists from Cornell and the University of Wyoming recently presented a more entertaining example reminiscent of something from a Pixar film. Think of uh, pulsating jello cubes sticking together and forming jiggling bodies that flee from spoon-wielding children, and you get the picture. I'm not going to go much further into that particular illustration. Interestingly, humans weren't the first to use this tool. Selective optimization finds elegant application in life, the most notable example being the process of antibody refinement known to biologists as affinity maturation, which plays an important role in the immune system of vertebrates like us. The antibody shown in figure 11.5 is a protein complex with two outwardly pointing sticky ends that facilitate the immune response by binding to invaders like bacteria and viruses. And there's a drawing of it with the two sticky ends, one there, one there. And uh, this end here, is made to fit into the immune system in various ways and uh, to trigger various immune responses. Of language and life. If you're interested in exploring evolutionary models further, I offer a free computational tool developed at Biologic Institute called Stylus. Our object in developing Stylus was to create a model world that captures the important features of the world of natural proteins. In the first place, we wanted a world where genes carry sequence instructions for making long chains, just as biological genes carry the instructions for making long protein chains. That part was easy. More challenging was the goal for these long chains to perform a great variety of actual functions based upon their structures, just as protein chains do. And I'm going to kind of skip through that part. In fact, um, skip most of it um, because it's kind of an arcane thing. It does show evolution kind of at work, but only uh, low level. And then he closes with this quote, nothing evolves unless it already exists. Now, my take on all this, I think Axe makes a good case for ignoring, the, ignoring claims like those uh, made by Jeremy England. They run against our intuition. Number one. Number two, that intuition can be backed up by sound mathematical reasoning. And number three, Axe points out that the originators of such claims do not behave as if they really believed them. Jeremy England type claims can be compared to get rich quick schemes. The principle is suspect. The details of the scheme are often deficient. If you want to be technical, they're always deficient. <clears throat> the question may be raised, do, do the purveyors put their own money into such schemes? And do they treat it just like yours if you put yours in, or do they take theirs out first? I think that it is helpful to have enough knowledge to appreciate the second argument. And that's part of what we do in this class a lot. But I think the first argument is also helpful, and the fact that they reinforce each other is particularly important. It is almost always used, at least subconsciously. Do you really believe that something came out of nothing? And what Axe is doing is, in fact, reaffirming it. Now, perhaps most importantly, once one has seen a demonstration that the second sort of reasoning always backs up the first, one can use the first as a convenient shortcut, as most of you did when you read of Jeremy England. You didn't wait to see what his argument that life just kind of arises from light and matter as a thermodynamic requirement. My own reaction to Jeremy England's claim was that his basic claim was counterintuitive. Really? You know? And that he offered nothing to back it up which in my opinion would be absolutely mandatory at this point. 
There are people who are fooled by their own propaganda. For example, the officer in charge of Chernobyl who believed the Soviet propaganda that this uh, facility could not fail if operated um, within certain guidelines. And of course, he turned out to be tragically wrong. So error cannot always be detected in this way, but it is suspicious when someone's behavior is not in accord with his or her professed beliefs. But Axe has shown that the design intuition is reliable and therefore should be relied on. However, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment. I'll just make this one one brief comment. Uh, the, uh, uh, in this whole argument, and this is very simplistic what I'm saying, but it's very real. Uh, we face the fact that evolution does work. Natural selection does work at a very simplistic level. And the strength of Axe's argument is when you try and extend it to reality that is much more complex. That uh, is basically like saying that if I can jump over a one-foot crack to get to your, uh, to get from my backyard to your backyard, that if our backyards are separated by the Grand Canyon, it's really no problem. And. Uh, and that's a minor example. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the figures we saw uh, last week and before, you know, just tell you. And, but it's so easy as you teach certain ideas to pick the simple and stop there and say, hey, I've, I've explained it, not realizing that. Quantitative evaluation is so important. Mathematical evaluation is so important. Yeah. Uh, and very strong. I, a lot of mathematics is just, you know, speculation. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's good math and there's bad math. Uh, and you need to distinguish. Yeah. Uh, yes, a comment over here. Just a minute. We're getting a mic for you. One of the things that impressed me very, a, a long number of years ago <laughs> is that um, whenever you send in something to be carbon dated, uh, they always ask you, where was this found? What layer did you discover it in? Things like this. So uh, it's very apparent to me that the people who do the carbon dating are guessing at the result that they want to put forward. Um, if they were not, then they wouldn't need to ask such questions. Um, so what they're doing is they're putting their own intelligent design on the carbon dating process. Well. I would have to say, knowing a little bit about carbon-14 dating, that it's not completely that simple. It's it's good to know, are you talking about a high range or low range because what comes out of the machine? But I agree with you that other, um, that other than, uh, you know, you should be able to say, well, we expect it to be, you know, this range or this range, or we don't know, and that should be enough. They should not... Um, they should not have a have to have. In fact, it's probably better if they don't. I mean, if we, if I draw a potassium on a patient and send it off to the laboratory, they don't ask, well, do you think it's going to be high or do you think it's going to be low? They put it in the machine and they give it back to me blinded. In fact, one of the things we found is that radiologists actually do a better job most of the time if they are given the chest x-ray first and then allowed to read it as they see it and then 
you come back at him and say, uh, you know, this, you know, to pay more attention to it afterwards. Because if they have to read it ahead of time, then they're reading it trying to be as objective as they can, whereas, you know, if you really want them to have a left lo uh, lower lobe pneumonia, well, yeah, maybe I can see that, where, you know, otherwise you would say, well, it actually looks normal to me. And that's, that's always a dangerous uh, setting. It does help to have some feedback, but it helps better to, to have looked at it ahead of time and made a guess first and then, and then see what's going on. Uh, comment here and then okay. back. If I understand the presentation and what Douglas Axe is saying, uh, intuition should be seriously considered and not totally ignored. I'm well, still having trouble uh, harmonizing the use of intuition with the use of um, logical reason, scientific method, and so on. And maybe some of you can help me understand what role should intuition play. And I'll add one more thing. This is my definition of intuition. It's common sense. We often say, well, it's obvious or common sense. Yeah, well, that's what he's calling it, common sense or yeah. common science, if you prefer. Uh, either one. If you go back 200 years to the... Um, the reign of deism, especially in, in America, there were a lot of people saying common sense, common sense, and arguing both in favor of Christianity and against Christianity. And kind of, in recent times, common sense has um, kind of uh, disappeared. Mm -hmm. So how do we keep a nice balance here, intuition and scientific, measurable reality? That's my question. Well, I, I think that some parts of common sense are more reliable than others. Um, and uh, it's basically what it boils down to, as far as I can tell, is uh, common science, common sense, um, If it's extrapolated beyond what we actually experience and assuming that everything is the way we, we know it now, probably is uh, unreliable. Um, you know, up is up and down is down. And, uh, but if you go around the world, why eventually what we thought was an absolute direction of up becomes absolute direction of down and vice versa. Um, and that's one place where common sense can can fool us, and then not only can fool us, but it, it has fooled people. Um, in uh, days of Augustine, for example, because they were saying, well, those people would walk around on their heads, and that doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. so they must not exist. Um, uh, you, you think I'm kidding? Uh, look up the real, literal meaning of Genesis and read it through. Um, uh, but <clears throat> at the same time, I think there are some things that do make sense. And I think his point about, you know, pulling a rabbit out of a hat, the reason you're there is because you know that really can't happen. Nobody except for maybe little children who um, haven't had enough experience with reality mm -hmm. believes that it happens. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, even uh, just a little bit older children, the first question they'll ask is not, is that real? But they'll go, how did you do that? So they know instinctively that that's not really what happened. See? Um, and that instinct is true. And one of the reasons that I, looking at the book, is actually not so much to say, well, just rely on your common sense, is to say, look, Axe has shown that this particular common sense thing is, in fact, reliable. And so what you can do is you can use it as a shortcut because it actually can be shown to be mathematically reliable. There are some things that are rules of thumb, and they work pretty well. <coughs> 
There are some things that are not rules of thumb. They're actually absolutely true. I can give you an example of something that is given as a rule of thumb. And that is if you, if you, uh, if you run a strip through at 25 uh, um, centimeters per minute, uh, which is a standard way of running uh, uh, EKG strips through, uh, that the rate will be uh, 300 divided by the, or, or pardon me, uh, yeah, the rate of a regular rhythm will be 300 divided by uh, the number of boxes it goes uh, of a certain size to go from one beat to the next. Now that's kind of a rule of thumb, works pretty well, well as it turns out, it's not just a rule of thumb, it will work to however many decimal places you can measure. It is in fact a mathematically correct, mathematically perfectly correct, as far, you know, as long as the measurements are correct, it, it's as good as the measuring device. That's a rule of thumb, but it's not just a rule of thumb. And the point of it is there are, there are some intuitions that we have that are pretty good rules of thumb, but you know, when you extrapolate them to the size of the earth, they don't work too well. There are some things that, that when you extrapolate, they just keep working and working and working. And those are the, one, those are the intuitions you really want to pay attention to because they are, in fact, correct. He mentioned beetles, and I know that there's like, you know, tens of millions of beetle species, if I'm not mistaken. Um, when you take a look at beetles, there's a lot of, uh, perhaps you could call them inventions, you know, pinchers that are particularly large, or proboscis, or shapes, or even colors that, that actually have functional utility. Um, does is he saying that because we recognize those as unique features which have specific functions, that those things would not be able to, you know, evolve? In other words, one species giving rise to a modified beetle that has something that works. I, I think if you were to push him at that point, I think he would say that uh, what we call species needs to be carefully evaluated and that what you can really say is that if one beetle has information, for example, um, orphan genes in it, and another beetle has different orphan genes in it, then they're separate designs. And so it's not really how long the proboscis is or whether it branches into three, or those kinds of things. It's does it have extra information in it? And if it has, a, and that means that you can't really do this <clears throat> just by looking at them. But you could do this by looking at their genomes. Um, uh, who will, that looks correct me if I'm wrong, but, but that's my understanding of how, uh, how they would do it. Now, <coughs> if you had, two beetles and one of them had orphan genes and the other one didn't have those orphan genes but it didn't have any new orphan genes, the second beetle could be a derivation of the first by degeneration. But um, that would be degeneration in number one. And number two, if the second beetle does have other genes, then it's a new invention, period. Mm -hmm even though it may have like 99.9% .9 identical genes. And the fact of the matter is that most of the time it's not that, uh, uh, not that close. And let me just um, give another example that, that perhaps is more familiar. I think that if you were to argue with him, you could get him to concede that dogs and coyotes and wolves are really all the same species and that they're separate inventions, if you want to call it that. Uh, I mean, so together inventions, they're, that they were invented all together. But that, um, but then dogs and cats, for example, are enough different, have enough different, uh, you know, DNA kind of things that, 
that they're separate inventions. And uh, so, I mean, I, I was reading Michael Behe once about the edge of evolution. I was stunned to say, see that he put it at the level of family on the average, which is about where most conservative creationists put it. Purely on the basis, uh, uh, because obviously he's not a believer in, in you know, Noah's Ark or short age or any of that kind of stuff. Um, he put it purely on the basis of uh, where the math came out. Um, I think that that's another one of our intuitions that probably uh, can be borne out by mathematics. And see, the value to me of this book is not so much that he tells you to, to, to believe your intuition. He's saying that your myth intuition is mathematically validated. And so you can believe it... <coughs> if you please, on the basis of the mathematical evaluation. Comment here and then back over there. Well, what I want to comment is in a different way to the gentleman down there in the blue shirt. Um, I went through a divorce some years ago, and it wasn't too long before we'd have a con uh, contradiction over here, one over here, we probably had two or three dozen contradictions. And some of it uh, was sized to whether, uh, say, the opponents uh, got to talk to the people before they made any kind of decision. So when they uh, came out with a decision, they agreed with the opponents. But if we talked to them first, it came out our way. And if they weren't told anything, it came out our way. So we had dozens and dozens of contradictions, and there's just no way any of it work was was correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've got kind of a cynical view of uh, of experts, to say the least. Well, one thing I would say is that what anybody says doesn't count as much. That's what the evidence is. No, not at all. And Eventually they have to <coughs> come to there is no such thing as authority in science in the final analysis. The only authority we have is provisional because they either have more experience or have, they've thought more clearly. And the more experience, in science anyway, is reproducible. That's pretty much the definition of science. Yeah, and and the more clear thinking is something that could be presented to anybody. So that when you get done, your authority in science is precisely, or it should be precisely in a way, and it's theoretically precisely, if you want to put it that way, uh, in direct proportion to your transparency. That's very important. Yeah. Comment over here. Well, I, I was just going to, along the same line, uh, just adding a muscle to an organism in the process of evolution. You know, we, we have all kinds of muscles. I don't know how many we have, uh, hundreds of them. Uh, and you start with an amoeba, it doesn't have any. Along this process, you had to add a lot of muscles. And so, well, so well, well, let's just add a muscle. This sounds a simple step. It's much more complex than you think to add a muscle. Muscle's useless. You, you add all the muscles you want to it, it's useless without a very complex controlling mechanism for it. You have to have nerves, you have to have a brain that co coordinates those nerves. Or? And you know, and you have to be able to move it part, partially, and when, when further, you want to move it further, and so on. You have that kind of control on it. The amount of pressure you put on it, different, I mean, these are different parts of the control system, and so on. Uh, this is, uh, it's extremely hard to be even at a simple part. Well, the thing of it is, I, I will have to say this, that once you have a generic for muscle, then all you really have to do is to figure out some way to make it attached from point A to point B. Yeah, but, but, what but we are not in a position to be able to say at all what that takes. Yeah, but where, where it's different from other muscles, 
and there's no point in uh, uh, having muscle exactly the same thing unless you it's in a different place. Uh, this involves complex control. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is we just, we have no clue as to what that is. In DNA, we at least have a clue as to exactly what we're dealing with. And that's why, to my mind, the DNA argument is, is so, I would say, overwhelming. We've got that one nailed. We understand how it works. And we understand that in order to get DNA, you have to search through a theoretical space that is, for practical purposes, infinite. It, it, it is fantastically large, and as, as he would say, it's practically impossible to find anything in that search space. You have no idea what kind of uh, base sequence you need to have. And the fact of the matter is that if there is a small base sequence that will give you a new muscle, it can probably be reached. If there is a large base sequence, probably not. And if there's a fantastically large sequence in order to change, to add a new muscle, it's not going to happen. Well, we, we could add to this, you know, if this is a random process, and, uh, you know, according to evolution, you have these random changes and the organism tries to evolve and it... Uh, uh, doesn't succeed by natural selection, where are these billions of organisms that tried to evolve and didn't make it? They're not in the fossil record. No, that's true. I mean, it, 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 the, the, the odds are too great. Yeah. Well, the claim, of course, would be that the fossil record is incomplete. Granted, but granted then there is. should still be more wrong forms than right forms. There should be a lot more wrong forms if you're going to use random changes. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is that you go into the fossil record and most of the time you can classify it fairly easily. And they, usually you find others. It was successful usually because you find that they, they tend to be in groups. Yeah. Yeah. Species. Specific. Well, next week come back we'll... Um, We'll work some more. Uh, it's, it's kind of, at least in my opinion, interesting all the way through. And uh, we're going to get into less of a uh, uh, less of a tearing down mode and more of a building mode. Um, it's fascinating. We're going to have an answer for the uh, for the uh, multiverse next week too. So uh, come on back. Uh, see you next week. <laughs>